What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over uh, stocks and lives. So by default, it's going to look like this. Now, this is just a huge update to the HUD, and the majority of the work today is going to be on the HUD elements, like such as getting these to show the correct character icon, and doing it in a little bit better way so that's not just hard-coded. I'm going to show you a few different ways you can do this and how to kind of organize it a little bit better if you don't like keeping everything individual. I'm also going to show you how to add lives and tell the game when to update. However, we won't be going over any sort of like death scenario to be able to actually use these functions yet, simply because, you know, we have to define where players get killed if they fall off or if they get knocked out of bounds. And that'll probably come in the very next episode. But I want to get this started kind of so we could get some widgets and some examples of what we want to do for the stocks and the deaths and things like that. So let's go into the code. And before we get started, this is episode, I believe, 18 or 19. We're pretty far along in this series, so you may want to start catching up. I'll go ahead and leave a link in this icon in the top right corner to the very first episode of the series. To be honest, I don't think you'll need anything else, um, like anything specific to make this one work if you don't want to get caught up in the series, but you may want to check out the HUD episodes because I do have some logic on the HUD that's going to be in this episode. But regardless, let's get started. First things first, we're, we should go ahead and make a lives variable in our character, that way we know how many lives they have. I made it an integer and of course U property so I can access it in blueprint. We will use it on the widget to determine how many we should display. For now we're just going to display them all and we will update the HUD with the correct value when we spawn in or when we lose a life. So lives and then we need a way to lose a life and I do have lose life here as a function. I just realized maybe you want to be have a way to add a life so you could do the reverse function of this. I do make a blueprint callable. Now if we go into the CPP file, it's very, very simple to set this up. Just in your constructor at the very top of your file, go ahead and set your number of lives. I've actually set it to be three. Oops, yeah, that's a good standard. And then let's go down make your lose life function, which should look like this. So I have um, minus minus lives, which basically it just takes away one from the lives variable. The reason I'm doing this is it's not necessary for you to understand right now. It'll make a little bit more sense when we can see it in action. I'll give you an example of why I chose to do it this way other than like minus equals one or lives minus minus if you're familiar with those two methods. But it doesn't matter too much. Just the, the fact of the matter is you need to be losing a life when this function gets called. So subtract one from lives. You can set it up just like that. And then we need to tell the HUD that we have lost a life. I mean, again, if, you're, if you also have a way to gain a life, then we still need to notify the HUD. Either way, the stocks will need to change. Whether you're using the actual icons or if you have like the stock icon and then like 95 because you're playing with 99 stocks. So it would be the number instead. Regardless, we need to be able to update the values on the HUD. Now, what we're going to need to do is get the game mode and call a notify HUD update live. So the game mode is what is spawning our HUD or what will be spawning our HUD once this episode is complete. So we want to do this from the game mode. The game mode is the best place to update lives on the HUD in my opinion because the game mode manages everything that's going on not in the specific characters. And since the HUD isn't really related to a specific character, but every character can see it, I think this is the best place for it. First things first, if you wanna be able to use the game mode reference that I've set up, you're going to need to include the SSB template game mode.h at the top of your SSB template character file. It's important. You don't wanna include the game mode in your header file. You can see I don't have it here. The reason for that is the game mode includes the character.h in the header file, and thus if the character file also included the game mode.h, then 
you would have a circular dependency where this is trying to include the game mode, but this is trying to include the character, and neither of them can complete until they can include one another. Now Visual Studio will tell you this, so it's not a big deal if you do it. It just won't compile. But you're going to want to put it in the .cpp file. See, I've done it here. And then what I'm doing here is getting the game mode. Unreal can get the game mode by getting the world and get the off game mode, which is basically the game mode that's on the server. And there's only ever one game mode and it's on the server. So clients and multiplayer games won't get this, but that's okay. You can still do this without, and we'll get into that later, later down the line when we get into online multiplayer. We're not there yet. But uh, once you get the game mode, we're casting it to our game mode type so that we can call a specific function on it. So cast a SSB template game mode, and then this is what we're putting in the parentheses. And lastly, we're setting it equal to this game mode ref. So the reason I put it in an if statement like this, if you have not seen this before, if auto game mode ref equals this cast, so auto is a very is a type that will automatically set the um, the type for you. So in this case, it'd actually be an a SSB template game mode, and we could just write that out. But I like using auto in an if statement like this because this kind of signifies that you know we're not going to be sure if this is going to return valid or not. We don't want to use anything that's not valid. Okay, if we tried to call this function and game mode ref was a null pointer or basically invalid, then this would cause a crash. By doing an if statement, it determines if this value that was returned from this operation is valid. So is game mode ref valid? And if it is, that's where the if statement comes in, then we do this logic. So it's basically an is valid check or just an if statement that checks for validity and non null pointers. Okay. And then there, we're gonna call notify HUD update lives with player number. Now, you don't have that function yet. So let's go into our SSB template game mode.h. And I've gone ahead and added this. It's a blueprint implementable event. So what that means is uh, this function is, you can call it in code, but we're not gonna define the logic that occurs in code. And the reason for that, we spawn the HUD in the blueprint. So I just, I already have the HUD reference in the blueprint. I figure I might as well just use the blueprint game mode to notify the HUD to update the logs. It takes in a player number because it has to know what character on the HUD we are updating. For now, it's not really going to matter because again, we don't have a way to just kill a specific character or for characters to fall off the map. When we get into that, you'll see how this works a lot better, but for now, just set it up this way so that we don't have to do this work later. Now, player number is a variable we have in the character. So if you miss that for any reason, basically it gets assigned in the order they get spawned. So the very first character that's in the game is player number zero. The second character that spawns in is player number one. The third character is player number two and so on and so forth. And that's pretty much all we need to do for the code today. So we can go into the editor. And there's a few things we need to do here, of course. So first things first is I want to show you a few different ways that we can actually set this up. Now, I have everything on the character HUD as of now. All right. So I didn't make any additional widgets here. These are all just images, like the main icon is an image. You have two different text blocks, one for the name, one for the percent for their damage counter, and then I've added five images to each player card here. That's what I call these. And that's good. But the problem is it is a lot of work when I want to change this around. And you could make these, you could organize these a few different ways. So let me show you why I did it this way. And let me show you what your other options are. So as annoying as it is to initially set up, I do enjoy setting this up on the character HUD because it does give you the benefit of being able to bind these images to a brush. If you were to make a widget, you can still bind them, but it can be a pain in the butt because you have to set them up a certain way to be able to bind them and and you have to do it for player one, two, three, and four, as opposed to just making a different binding for each of them. You have to actually 
uh, prepare the widget to be bound by each of them. You can pass it an integer parameter, but the problem with that is if I'm doing all that, then this HUD is not going to have all the information it needs if I want to use those values later on. So then I have to reference other things to be able to use these bindings. It's not the end of the world. In fact, the performance is probably about the exact same, but I just prefer doing it this way. It's easier for me other than the initial time. But again, I'm going to show you how you can do it a few different ways. So I've added five images for my stock icons. After that, we'll just have one stock icon and a number like times 97 or something for 97 stock. We haven't gotten to that part yet, but we will be covering that in a future stock episode. And I've just, I've made their own canvas, the player one stock icon canvas. There's no real need for this. It's just that it lets me organize these images a little bit better and I can expand and collapse them as necessary. You can see I've done it for player two, player three, and player four. Now, honestly, there's nothing here that you really need to see. I can just show you one and then it'll be the same for everybody. So let's go to player one, stock icon one. This is just an image that I brought onto the screen, placed it where I wanted it, and then bound it. So we do have to cover the bindings so that you know what, uh, how to grab the correct image. But other than that, I haven't changed anything else about these images. They're just images with a binding. And I, of course, changed their size to be the appropriate size. If we go into the graph, um, I do have a few things here that we're going to need to update. So we did have in the HUD before us grabbing the game instance and grabbing the game mode, but we were never actually setting the game mode reference. We were setting the game instance reference. So off of your cast to the game mode, go ahead and uh, save out a variable to this. You can just drag off of your game mode and do promote to variable, and that'll make one for you. Or if you really wanted, you could go up here, make a new variable, and then go down to its type by selecting the, the little icon and then search for your actual game mode that you want. Oops, there you go. Either way. The rest of this can stay the same. This is all related to the um, spawning of characters and how we're going to assign them in the HUD. Now remember, we're specifically talking about four players here. We are going to get into you know hiding these things when we have less than four players, but I want to get down multiplayer menus first or determining if they're AI at the very least before we cover any of that. So we're just assuming this four players. If they're not, no big deal. All right, for the bindings. Now the bindings are gonna be the same for all of them. We're just going to change the values that we actually access. So we have a player's array in our game instance reference. So our game instance has a player's array that has the data for each player. It'll have their name and maybe the character type that they are or something like that, right? But the game mode will have a player's array that has the actual uh, character references. You know, not just the character class, but their actual references. The, the very first binding here, get player one stock icon one pro zero. Now that's the name that it comes up with when you click on the brush here and just bind it. So you just hit create binding or if, the, if you don't have a binding on it, I, I'm pretty sure it'll say new binding add binding maybe, but just click the one that's clearly saying like create a new binding. And here's what I've done. I grab my game instance reference and I grab my players array. I grab the length from that and I make sure that it's greater than or equal to one. Remember the length of something does not start at zero. It's not like an index in, in computing where, you know, it starts at zeros. The length returns the actual number of elements in the array. So if we're accessing the first character, and we want to determine their stock, then we need to make sure that the length of the player's array is at least one or greater. And if it is, if it's true, then I go ahead and grab the specific index I need. So game instance reference players get zero. Um, I'm also specifically using the get a ref which is a reference, which is a little bit more efficient than a copy, and we don't need a copy here. 
so. Okay, and then I break it. That way I can access all the variables within the players, the player details structure here. Now specifically, we need the character class because we just need to know what icon to display. There's a few ways you could do this. You could just have an array of icons like I'm doing here, or you could actually make a, a blueprint function library and make some functions to always determine the right image to go with the character. I don't feel that's necessary because again, this is a one-time thing. Sure, this is a binding, but once you, once it has the right character class for this player, it won't cause an issue unless your character class changes. And honestly, if your character class is changing in the middle of the game, there's a good chance you might want it to, like from Zelda going to Sheik or something like that. So I think this is a pretty good way to do it. But you can just drag off your character class to switch and it will come up. As long as you have contact sensitive, it'll come up as the, pretty much the only option unless you have other enums on this type. And then, you know, it'll give you all your types. So for mannequin, I go ahead and choose this option. But for mannequin 2, I go ahead and choose this option. So I've gone ahead and made a character icon array. Now we had these mannequin character icon brushes. And I've actually left them in. I haven't deleted them. So you can still see them. This is what we were doing before. And this is fine. But as we get more and more characters, we don't want to have like 80 variables for the 80 characters we have. So let's just go ahead and make an array of slate brushes. And you see that's what this is. To make a variable array, just click on the type and select the type you want. Then go to the details panel and um, on the variable type here, you can choose this is single variable, this is array, this is a set, and this is a map. We want the array, it's nine squares. Then you can, you'll have to compile once you've done it and save, but then you can add elements to your array. I've added two and I've added each image. You can add them just by clicking on these and selecting the image you want. And this is really useful because now I don't have to, you know, grab these individual variables and I'll delete these after this episode. We could even do it now, but I'm not going to do it now to, to not confuse anybody. Just notice you don't need these two anymore. We're just going to be using the array from here on out. And then I grab the, the proper index. Now, you could do it a few different ways to get this as well, like instead of hardcoding zero and one, if you had a character index, like for example, in Super Smash Brothers, Mario, let's say he's always top left, well then maybe we know if, it, if it's this class, we always use the Mario index, whatever. But as long as you keep it consistent, it'll be okay, regardless of how you do it. Okay, and now the good thing is, all the other ones, all the other bindings are exactly the same with a change to the length check and the index that we're accessing. So let's go to get player two stock. We just make sure that the length is greater than or equal to two. There has to be at least two players to access player two's stock information and their player details. If there are two or more players, then we have to get index one. If we're going for, for player two, Player one is index zero, so player two is index one. The rest of the function is exactly the same. Player three, just make sure that the length is greater than or equal to three and grab index two. Player four, make sure the length is greater than or equal to four and grab index three. And you can continue to do this for however many players you want. If you want to make it a little bit more dynamic, just make an overall function that takes in an integer and pass in the player number with it make sure the length is equal greater than or equal to that player number and make sure you grab the index of that number that's passed into it minus one okay now the last thing we need in the character hud is to make an update stock function so update stock is what i'm doing to actually change the value of how many stocks you see so, you know, sure, we can go ahead and grab the value of how many stocks we have and just display it here, but we need a way to know when we're supposed to update it. So the notify HUD, is the, the game mode function, the blueprint implementable event we made in code, is what that's meant to do. Let's take a look at the game mode. We're not going to be updating all this. There's a lot going on. But this is our um, 
begin play of our game mode. If we scroll all the way over to the end, this is where we're setting our character references and things like that. At some point in here, go ahead and create your character HUD widget, set the HUD reference, and then add it to the viewport. The way you do this is you do create widget from class. Actually, you just need create widget. And then you choose the type you want, our character HUD. You can drag off of it and promote it to a variable. I called mine HUD reference. And then you can drag off that and add to viewport. Okay, so this will create your HUD. Now it's important to note, before this episode, we were doing it in the level blueprint. So now in all your levels where you had logic for it, like in the main menu, I'm, I'm creating the character select screen and adding to the viewport, we wanna keep that. But in my other levels, for example, my training room level, I want to remove the creation of the character HUD. Otherwise, I'll have two HUDs on top of each other, and that won't look good. Now, you could also take this out and put this in the, in the game mode. Honestly, you really should. But because it's not related to this episode, we'll cover it more when we get it into uh, cameras for the Super Smash Brothers series. So remove your character HUD creation, adding it to the viewport. We're only doing it in the game mode now. We only ever want to do this one time. And now that we've created it and set the HUD reference in here, we can use the HUD reference to call a function off of it. Now remember, we need to make the update stock function. So in your character HUD, you can go up to functions and plus function, call it update stock, compile it after you make it, and add a player number integer input parameter here. So call it player number, select the integer type. Then here's the update stock function. Now, in the base game mode BP again, now that we have this function made, we can use the event notify HUD update lives. This was the function we made in code. We can just type in the name of this, notify HUD update lives, and it will pop up as the only option. Then once you have this, it already has player number because that was a parameter we gave it. We also have our HUD reference now from creating it and begin play. You can drag off your HUD reference and call update stock and then pass in the player number. Okay, I've already done that, so I delete those extra ones, but here you go. So now we're calling the update stock function every time that a player loses their life with the correct player number. So that's good. It's a very good way to do it. Now we just have to fill out the update stock function and we'll be good to go. In update stock, we are going to essentially grab the correct player with the live amount or, or, or the life amount and the lives amount that they have. And then we are going to represent everything accordingly. The easiest and most efficient way I found is to do it this way, but there are plenty of other ways to do it. You could just hide them based on, you know, if they've got five, hide none of them. If they got four, hide everything greater than four, so five. Uh, if they have one, hide everything greater than one, so two, three, four, and five. You could also um, only spawn them. You could spawn them and remove them from parent. So as they uh, spawn them to show the lives and then remove them from parent as they lose them, there's a ton of different ways you could do it. This is the way I'm going to do it. So first of all, in update stock, remember we have this player number. We're going to use this player number to grab the specific player that's losing the life. So that way we can grab their lives amount and then perform logic based on that. So use your game mode reference that we made earlier. Drag off of that and get the player's array from that. Remember, this is different from the game instance array because it's not an array of player details, it's an array of the actual character type. These players are SSB template character object references. And then we're going to get off of this. And uh, we have to get a copy in this case, we don't have a choice. Then drag your player number into the get and then drag off the get output here and look for lives. And we'll get our lives variable that we made earlier. Then we wanna do a switch on the player number, not on the lives, this is important. You see the lives go down here. The player number comes over here and goes into the switch on int here. So just add a switch on int like this and then drag the 
uh, player number into it. I've gone ahead and hit add pin and I've added four different pins, zero, one, two, and three to represent each of my characters. I've only set it up for one right now just because there are going to be some changes I'm going to make when we do the next stock episode. So I didn't want to have you guys do a bunch of logic and then uh, change it all on you. If we do it with just player one for now, then we won't really have to change anything down the line, which is excellent. So if the player number is zero, so basically if this is player one, then we are going to uh, perform logic. You could also, you know, you could set it up for all the characters and you could also set default to be one of these as well if you want. Default will just happen if none of these are true, but it is an integer being passed in. So say the integer was seven. Well, seven is not zero, one, two, or three, so it would take the default node here. I'm gonna grab my player one stock icon canvas. Remember I put everything into a canvas. So the way you do this is you do canvas panel, you drag it onto the screen, just like that. And then you can just reassign all your images to be children of this by, by selecting them and then hovering over it so it looks like this, where it looks like I'm putting it inside of the canvas. Because we're going to access all the children and the children are gonna be stored in an array in the order that they're stored in the hierarchy here. So icon one is the first index, two is the second, three is the third, four is the fourth, five is the fifth. We can do a nice little trick here to loop through all the children. So grab your player one stock uh, icon canvas right here. And the way you do that, I should have mentioned, is you have to make sure it is a variable here. Once you click on it, go to the details panel and make sure it is a variable. Drag it onto the scene. Get all children. And then loop through all your children. Okay. See, that's what I'm doing above. Now, I'm dragging off of the um, array element and the array index. The array index is going to be used here to check against the lives amount. This is a fancy little way to do it. So grab the array index and check if it's less than. Okay. And you can see this is the lives variable. Drag that into the bottom of this less than. So is the array index less than our lives amount? If it is, then we want to make it visible. I mean, think about it. If we go into our designer here, say we have, um, we're on array index three. That means that we have three lives. So the lives we wanna display are the ones to the left of that. And what do you know, if we put them in order, it's the ones that are lower on the, the children list, right? In the hierarchy, they're higher up because this is index one, this is index two, well, this is the first index, the second index, and the third index. So if we have three lives and the array index um, is less than three, then we wanna display two and one as our lives. We wanna make sure that all the lives that we have are represented and none of the lives we don't have are represented. Again, if we have three lives, we don't wanna display the fourth and fifth stock icon, it doesn't make sense. So this little trick here is taking the array index of the children of this canvas and comparing it to the lives value from our character. And if the array index is less than our lives amount, then we display it to the screen. All right, then we take our array element and this is, remember this is the specific stock icon and we're gonna set the visibility. You just drag off and do set visibility. And I'm uh, doing a little bit of a branch here where we do, if it's true that this array index was less than lives, then we go ahead and set it to be visible. Otherwise we set it to be hidden. And that will make it so only the lives we want to show up are showing up. Okay, so now we can play our game and we'll see our stocks working accordingly. Um, they won't really update unless you force yourself to lose a life somewhere and even then it'll only update for player one. 
So right now, don't really expect them to work. We're going to do plenty of logic to make them actually work. And, and I'll, I'll cover the lives and the actual lose life function again in that episode. But it's just important that we get that started so we can kind of set up how we're going to manipulate these lives, whether we add to them or subtract from them. Regardless, we will be setting that up soon. Now, what I did want to show you is I have a few different ways that I've set up. You can actually, uh, you know, configure these things on your widget. So first of all, I have a stock icon. You could add a stock icon and add a bunch of these widgets instead of just regular images. So I don't know why the stock icon comes in full size. Do you see that? Weird. Um, but yeah, you could you could add an image and then bind it to something and then add it to your character HUD. But really, this is more complicated than just adding images anyway, in my opinion. So perhaps a better thing to do is you can add a stock icon row where I've added all five and put them in a, a container canvas. Now, this could definitely work. I'm not sure if you could bind this because, quite frankly, I've never tried binding multiple icons or widgets. Like, in this case... This is actually five stock icons, the widget I was just showing you. And I'm not sure if you can bind them individually within a container of another widget within a widget. So this might actually, you might not be able to bind it, but you can definitely still grab the variable instances and set their image. So you could still set them to the correct character using the same logic. A binding is just a function that Unreal kind of handles for you. Really, it's no different than, than dragging off of the image so getting the image of one of these icons and doing set brush. Set brush is what you do to set a texture, which is how you can set an image to an image widget. And lastly, um, if you don't, if you want to be fully complete, you can actually make a widget of the player card. I was calling this the player cards. You can make a player card widget which has all your information and just bind everything in here. Again. I don't know if you can bind everything in your character HUD through the widget that you add to it, but you can definitely just grab all the variables and all of the widgets within this widget. I know that's a little bit confusing, but technically this whole thing is a widget, but all of these are also widgets. Like this image is an image widget. This canvas is a canvas widget. So um, I know it's a little bit confusing, but you can grab everything within this blueprint widget, we'll call that as like the base widget, and you can set everything accordingly. The images, the damage counter, the text. So it's however you want to do it. For now, since I know I'm only going to have four and I can just hide and make visible when I want them to, that's, this is okay. We are going to get into like eight players and things like that, but I'm going to make a different HUD for that anyway, as it is in Super Smash Brothers, so I'm not too worried. I only really have to set this up once. But I want to give you options. I don't want you to think you have to follow exactly what I'm doing. There's a ton of different ways to do this. And some are better than what I choose. And some are, you know, it depends on the situation. Now, the last thing I want to show you is how to actually add these. So once you make a widget that you want to use, like say you want to use that player card one, you can look in your palette and under user created, you'll actually be able to see the widgets that you've made. So I can drag a player card onto the screen. And I can access everything from there because it is a variable. So there you go. That's a pretty easy way to go and manipulate your HUD and, and get everything working how you want it to work. And then you can play around with it and enjoy yourself. See whatever's easiest and whatever's best for you given the circumstances. But that's all I got for you guys today. In the next episode, we will cover uh, actually defeating opponents by knocking them off the edge or sending them into kill boundaries. And uh, at that point, we will actually make the stocks update at least the icons, whether we do anything with the lives other than subtract from it is, you know, up for debate still. We'll see if we do anything with it. But uh, we will at least make sure that we can defeat opponents and make them lose stock so that it's represented on the HUD we made. But that's all I got for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it and this helped you make the uh, stock that you wanted in your game, then please subscribe. It does more for me than anything else you can do, and it's completely free. I just really appreciate it. Let's me know I'm doing a good job and it really helps the channel. If you had issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. There's a link in the description. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much 
for all the extra support you've given. I just really appreciate it. It really helps me continue these series, so thank you so much for going the extra mile to help me out. Lastly, guys, if you want to check out some live coding and hang out with me on a more personal basis, I do have a Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash on the road 27, where I stream games and programming, live streams. But also live on this channel, on the YouTube channel, I do a programming live stream every single Friday. So from 68 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am working on a side scroller game that looks like Castlevania. Well, it's going to it's going to hopefully play and look like Castlevania. Um, so feel free to come check that out and, and hang out with me as I do that. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.